TLM, let me make some room. Okay, I have to do anything. Okay, so let me make some remarks about the fluctuation theorem. My about looks like a lot. Okay, so I mean, one thing that is nice is that we saw that delta S total of gamma is a ln of P. Well, let's call it prob to keep the notation. The probability of gamma over the probability of gamma reversed. Now I can define a new probability, which is probability reversed of gamma is equal to probability of gamma reversed, okay? If I use this new function, Okay. I'm back. Okay, so if I use this new function, <clears throat> then I can write that thing as prob of gamma over prob reverse of gamma. There are different probabilities in a sense. They do they give different ways to the trajectories. Now, if I want to write the average delta S total, that will be a sum over all gamma probability of gamma ln of the probability of gamma over probability of gamma reverse, right? And if you know kubak Leiber divergences, that's exactly the kubak Leibler divergence between prob and prob reverse, okay? Which is like a very explicit relationship between interproduction and, you know, the fact that interproduction is related to the difference between four trajectories and reverse trajectories, okay? And the kubik library divergence is something that shows up a lot in information theory. It's not really a distance because it's not symmetric. So, you know, if I change, if I change these two things here of the position of these two things, I get a different thing. So it's not symmetric, but it's always larger than zero, right? It's a, uh, it's a, uh, and it's kind, it's a kind of very nice formula. Okay, so, you know, if I write the average into production, I can write the average production this way, which can be very useful in different circumstances. And because, you know, there are lots of properties that this kubic library divergence must fulfill. So if you write it like this, you can use properties that are well known in information theory, okay? So that's a very nice formula. When people talk about uh, the relationship between entropy and irreversibility, or, you know, the fact that the fourth trajectory must be somehow different from the reverse trajectory, or more likely than the reverse trajectory, I mean, that's really the formula that uh, expressed this idea quite explicitly. Okay. The other thing is, um, you know, we did we did this fluctuation theorem here, right? Each to the power of minus delta s total equal to one. That's the one we did. But there is another one, which is I can think about the probability that delta s total is equal to x, right? That would be the sum over all trajectories, the probability of the trajectory. But I must I must sum over all trajectories such that delta s total of gamma is equal to x, right? So if I sum of x is a number here, okay, so let's say x is equal to 10, and I wonder what's the probability that the production is equal to 10, I have to sum the weight of all tra trajectories such that the delta s total of the trajectory is equal to 10, okay? Okay, now an important property is that if delta s total of a trajectory gamma is equal to x, then the delta s total of the reverse trajectory is going to be equal to minus x, right? From the definition of delta s total, right? Remember delta s total was equal to 
to ln of sorry delta s total was equal to gamma was equal to ln of probability of gamma over probability of gamma reversed, right? And so, you know, if I do that as of gamma reversed, and of course, each trajectory has only one reversed, right? There's a one to one mapping. So if I do the delta S out of gamma reversed, I'll get ln of probability of gamma reversed divided by ln of probability of gamma, of gamma, which is the reversed of gamma reversed, right? So, yeah. So that's the properties I would be interested in. Now, okay, so if I do these two probabilities, probability of delta s total equals to x, probability of delta s total equals to minus x. So I'm doing the ratio of these two things. Then I'm gonna get the sum of gamma delta overall gamma probability of gamma of delta s total okay delta s total equals to x divided by probability of sum over gamma of delta s total equals to x probability I could say gamma reversed here. I mean, that works also. Okay, so, you know, I can change this thing here by probability of gamma reversed e to the power of x, right? Because e to the power of delta s total is gonna be probability of gamma divided by probability of gamma reversed, okay? So if I look at these two fractions, each term in the sum that is this multipl is multiplies each to the power of x, so the two the power of x can go out of the sum, and then that's going to be equal to each to the power of x. Okay, so this is another version of the fluctuation theorem. I mean, we could say it's more general than the other one. So this is called the integral fluctuation theorem. This is sometimes called the Taylor fluctuation theorem, but it's a little bit tricky calling it the Taylor fluctuation theorem. It depends on the situation. But you know, there are two different versions. So you know, the Jasinski equality, the very well-known Jasinski equality, is, the, is of this form here, and what's called the Crookes relation is of this form here. Okay, but they are more or less equivalent. Okay, it's not the both of them are true. One could say this one here is even more a little bit more general, but you know, again, it's just a different version of the fluctuation theorem, okay? Uh, another remark I should make is that, I mean, uh, we could also consider a case where the transition rates like Wij depend on time, okay? And you know, if we're talking about the Crookes relation or the Jasinski relation, they are such that the transition rates depend on time. What does it mean for the transition rates to depend on time? It means that some thermodynamic parameter is time dependent. Like for example, the temperature, the energy. So there is like a, that's what we call a protocol, okay? When, when you hear the word protocol in stochastic thermodynamics, it simply means that there is some thermodynamic parameter that's a function of time. It could be the energy, could be the pro, could be could be the temperature, some chemical potential, some affinity, whatever, okay? And this, you know, mathematically, this would simply mean that the transition rates would depend on time. Now, if you have a protocol that's time dependent, okay, you always have to consider the probability of the forward trajectory and then you have to consider the probability of the reverse trajectory, but this probability of the reverse trajectory must be, you must have a star on it because you also have to reverse the protocol, okay? So, I mean, let me give you a physical example, okay? Let's say you have a particle in a harmonic trap, okay? And you can do a Langevin equation for that. You can also do a master equation if you want to do it discrete, okay? 
It is a single part, a single coil of part in harmonic trap, okay? And let's say, let's call X zero as the position of, of the, the minimum of this harmonic trap, okay? But let's say I make X zero depend on time, okay? So let's say I have X zero, I'm using X for a lot of stuff, but maybe I, not, I don't call this X zero, let's call this Y zero, okay? Uh, but why is, okay, this X here has nothing to do with the first state in a trajectory, okay? That's just the position of the minimum of the harmonic trap when I have a colloidal particle, okay? The black thing is a colloidal particle uh, and the other thing is a harmonic trap, okay? And let's say, I don't know, I do an experiment where I, I increase the position of the harmonic trap linearly with time, okay? I do something like this, okay? I start at some position, let's say, I don't know, it starts at uh, 10, whatever the unit is, let's say it's micrometers or whatever, and I go until 100, okay? I don't know, the time is, is initially zero and the final time is some final time TF, okay? That's a protocol, right? That's, that's a way of changing things. And you know, if I was to do transition rates in a discrete setting, or if I was to do a continuum thing, I would have a transition rates that change with time, okay? So, what does it mean to do the forward protocol? The forward protocol means I start at 10 and I go, I increase linearly up to 100. The reversed protocol would be, I start at 100 and I decrease linearly to 10, okay? So, you know, if I was to do the fluctuation theorem for a situation like this, I would have to consider four trajectory with the forward protocol going from 10 to 100. And then I would have to consider the reversed trajectory but not with the forward protocol, but with the reversed protocol, okay? I would have to start at 100 and go to 10, okay? So that's kind of an important difference. If you have some protocol, some time-dependent transition rates, not only have to reverse the trajectory, but you also have to consider the reverse of the protocol, okay? And if you do that, you are gonna get the fluctuation theorem, okay? Just, that's kind of a technical note. Okay. Um, the other thing is, you know, I discretize the time and here I would like to give a little bit of a justification. So, you know, why discrete time? So if you remember, I defined a matrix M, you know, and the diagonal elements of this matrix look like one minus delta Ri and the off diagonal elements of this matrix look like delta W. Ij, that would be Mji, okay. All right, and that would be Mii, okay. Now, if delta is very small, the diagonal elements are close to one and the off diagonal elements are close to zero, okay? What does it mean a trajectory? In a trajectory means that if I have a trajectory that starts at x0, goes to x1, and then at some point it's gonna be at some point, let's call it xm, and, uh, and keep going until the final point of the trajectory. Now, if I do a trajectory, then, you know, the most likely scenario, let's say I start at state I, okay? Let's say this initial state X zero is just, I call it I. If I'm at state I, then the most likely scenario is that after a jump, I will remain in state I because, you know, the probability of not changing my state is much higher than the probability of changing state. So what I could ask is, let's say XM here is defined as the first, the point where the state changes for the first time in this case, right? That's the first change of the state. And let's say I wanna calculate the probability. What's the probability that it takes M jumps, M transitions for the state to change, right? Well, that's pretty easy to calculate. That's gonna be one minus delta Ri to the power of M, right? That's the probability that I do not change my state for M jumps, right? And I have to normalize this probability. In order to normalize it, I have to, if I sum over all M, I must guess one. So to normalize it, I just multiply it by delta Ri, okay? So that's gonna be, so if now if I did that, if I sum PM, PM from zero to infinity, I'll get one, okay? Okay, so that's the probability that, that's kind of my waiting time probabilities. How long, how long is gonna take me for me to, I mean, it could take one jump, it could take me 
10 transitions. It depends on the particular model, but you know, that's kind of a probability of, that's kind of a waiting time probability, right? It's how, how many jumps do I need? How many transitions do I need to jump? And what I'm gonna do is to just take the continue limit now. So let's say I have time T, that's the time it takes for me to, that's the waiting time, okay? How long did it take me to leave the state where I was? And so uh, this time is just gonna be M delta, right? Because again, delta is the size of the thing. So I can write PM as one minus, all right. And M, I write it as um, T over delta. And then this one, I write as T. And then I divide by T over delta, right? Okay, so that's it. And then I have a delta ri outside, okay? Okay, so, you know, if I take the limit, limit of delta going to zero. This thing here is simply gonna be e to the power of minus ri t, okay? That's definition of an exponential. And if I, you know, if I transform from the variable m, discrete m to continuous. So instead of B, let's use some other letter. Let's just call the waiting time distribution Q. And let's not use a function. Let's just use a subscript because M is discrete, okay? So I'm calling this Q because I don't want to use P anymore. Okay, so I mean, if I do that, then I will recover exponential. And no, if I go from, from QM, discrete QM to continuous Q of T, then then I must divide by delta. And so my Q of T from that formula that is simply gonna be Ri is the power of minus Rit, okay? And, you know, if I do a continuous time trajectory, as I told you, I'm gonna have these waiting times, okay? So in the continuous time trajectory, I have a waiting time. So I stay in a trajectory for a certain amount of time, and then I do a transition. So the reason to use discrete time is that, you know, the, the trajectory is just a product of this M transpose Xn let me write this here. So for discrete time, I wrote the trajectory as M transpose Xn, Xn plus one. If I was to write the weight of a trajectory in continuous time, I have to keep these waiting times, okay? So it will be a product of the transition rates, Wij, so W from X to the next X, but I will also have um, this waiting times trajectory, which makes the expression of the trajectory more complicated. It makes the number of possible trajectories equal to infinite. So, you know, it's something that is mathematically a little bit harder to deal with, okay? Though it's completely unnecessary and I don't know why people still do it in stochastic thermodynamics, but because if something is true for, for discrete time, then it must be true for, for continuous time because continuous time is a particular case of discrete time, okay? While, while the, other way, the other way around is not true. If you prove something for continuous time, it's not necessarily true for discrete time, okay? Or for all, all discrete time cases. Discrete time is a little bit more general than continuous time. Okay, so that's just a, a sort of an explanation to why I have used discrete time and not continuous time. Okay, it's just that I, I, I wanted to avoid using um, waiting times distributions when I write the probability of a trajectory, which kind of makes things a little bit harder. Okay, so with this, we finished the fluctuation theorem and I wanna start the thermodynamic uncertainty relation, okay? So, you know, the, the way I advertised things was that there are like these two main results in stochastic thermodynamics. One was the fluctuation theorem that was in the mid 90s. This one is way more recent, it's 2015. And this was this one was done by myself and Udo Seifert. And um, I mean, what they have in common again is that they both, they are both about 
the fact that fluctuations cannot be anything, right? For the fluctuation theorem, what we saw is that fluctuations cannot be anything. Either you say the probability distribution of entropy has the symmetry, it cannot be anything, but it must it is it it must fulfill the symmetry, or you know, you can you can do the integral fluctuation theorem, one of the two. And the thermodynamic state relation is another constraint of possible fluctuations in thermodynamic quantities. Okay. So in order to do the fluctuation theorem. I'm going to consider a specific example, and the specific example is the same one from before. Is the case of uh, that is the enzyme. Okay, that will be substrate as, and then that will be product P. Okay. And again, uh, concentrations of S and P are fixed. And you know, we are in a steady state, meaning that the rate at which we burn substrate S is fixed, okay? I called it stationary, I think, I don't remember anymore. But I think I called it stationary. But stationary or static, it doesn't really matter. Stationary state. Okay, that's the same situation as before. Now let's think about the random variable x, which is the number. And again, I'm using x a lot, but this x is not trajectory anymore. But it is the number of consumed s by E, okay? So, you know, that's how I could measure an experiment. I just, you know, whenever E consumes a substrate, maybe I see some sort of blinking in my experiment and then I can measure how many, how many ATP has my enzyme burned after 10 minutes, okay? And then I can measure it's a number. It might be 100, it might be two, it might be minus five, right? It could be negative because sometimes I do the chemical reaction in the reverse direction. And so, you know, this X is gonna be a random variable, right? Okay. And you know, the average of X divided by T is gonna be the current that we saw in the previous part of the lecture, right? I'm going to the simplified version of the model that we had before. It's gonna be even simpler than the three state model, but you know, that's what we saw. And we also saw that, you know, in equilibrium, the average X is gonna be zero, right? In equilibrium, I have no current, so, you know, I do not, on average, I do not consume substrate. Sometimes I consume substrate, sometimes I consume product, but you know, I can go either left to right or right to left, right? There is no preferred direction in the chemical reaction. So, you know, on average, if I'm in equilibrium, my average X is gonna be zero. Now, I would like to think about epsilon square, X square minus X square which gives like the precision of the variable X, right? And you know, what I can see is that in equilibrium, epsilon goes to infinity. So I have no precision in equilibrium in a sense, okay? I just, you know, since X is the average is zero, I could say that I have no precision in a sense. Now, um, if I wanna have a finite epsilon, so if, let's say I want a precision of 1%, that would mean I want epsilon to be equal to 10 to the power of minus two. Okay, the question is, what is the cost of precision in X, okay? You could say X is the output of the chemical reaction, right? X is the product that I produce or the substrate that I consume, whatever, okay? But what's the cost of precision? I know that I must be out of equilibrium in order to have some precision but the question is, is there a minimum amount of energy I must pay? So let's say I want, a, I want a precision of 1%. How much do I have to pay for that, okay? That's the kind of, and, and I mean, cost here simply means the amount of energy that I'm burning, right? So if I burn one ATP, I would burn like 20 KBT, right? In physiological conditions. So how much substrate do I have to consume in order to have a certain precision? That's the question. Um, so how much energy do I have to burn to have a certain precision, 
And you know, there is a minimal cost to that. That's the term, and, and that's what the thermodynamic conservation will tell us is what is the cost of this thing. Okay, so now I'm going to simplify the model for that. I'm just going to say that I have like a bias random walk, okay? And if the bias random walk goes from X into X plus one, that will be the same as doing this chemical reaction here, E plus S goes into ES, goes into EP, goes into E plus P. And if the bias random walk goes from X into X minus one, I'm going to say that E plus P went into E P. So it's an even more coarse grained version of the model that we had before. I don't, I don't want to describe all three states. I just want to say that if I do one, one chemical reaction is a jump forward in a bad random walk. And if I do the other chemical reaction, it's a dump backward in the other direction. Okay, so that's what I mean by jump forward and that's what I mean by jump backward. Now, this will happen at a rate K plus, okay? And this one here will happen if a rate K minus, okay? So basically from the generalized state balance, we have that K plus over K minus is gonna have to be e to the power of beta delta mu, okay? That was generalized state balance condition. Before I had three rates because I was doing rates for each one of these transitions. But now I'm just saying that, you know, I have a bias random walk. If I jump from X to X plus one, that's the same as doing the chemical reaction in the four direction. And if I jump from X to X minus one, that's the same as jumping, as going the backward direction of the chemical reaction. And I just use K plus K minus as effective transition rates to discard that. And, you know, from what we had before, the transition rates must fulfill this relation here, okay? Okay, so let's, See how the master equation will look like. It will look like P of X T DT is equal to K plus P of X minus one T plus K minus P of X plus one T minus K plus plus K minus P of X T, right? That's the master equation for a bias random walk. I ran. I can jump into a state X from X minus one with a rate K plus. I can jump into X from X plus one with a rate K minus. And then I can jump out of X either K plus or K minus. Okay, K plus would be I jump to X plus one and K minus would be that I jump to X minus one. Okay. Okay, that's my master equation. Uh, and now I wanna solve this equation. Basically what I wanna do is calculate the X square minus x average square over x average square. Okay, that's what I want to calculate. That's the first thing I want to calculate and then I want to calculate the cost, okay? So first I'm going to calculate that. Then I'm going to calculate the cost. What I will show is that there will be a trade-off between, not that one could say a trade-off maybe. There will be some relationship between both of them and this relationship between both of them is going to give, is going to answer me this question here, okay? The question I want to answer is this one. What's the cost of precision? And that's the question that the thermodynamic consent relation answers, okay? Okay, so let's calculate that. Uh, okay, so that's not a very hard calculation. The way you solve an equation like this is a linear equation, okay? You do a Laplace transform, that will make your life much easier. And so, I will define a P tilde ZT as the sum from x, x goes from minus infinity to plus infinity, okay? E to the power of z x p of x t, okay? Now I'm gonna multiply both sides by e to the power of z x. When I say both sides, I mean of this equation here. Okay, I'm gonna multiply both sides by e to the power of z x and I'm gonna sum over all x in both sides of the equation, okay? So I get dp tilde, z dt is equal to the sum in x e to the power of z x p. So for this one, I have px minus one, so k plus px minus one t 
plus sum in x e to the power of cx k minus p of x minus one t. Then I have minus k plus plus k minus, and in this case, I just get p tilde of z and t, right? Now, this sum here can be written as e to the power of z. Okay, let me do this one explicitly so that you get the idea, sum over x, e to the power of z, x plus one. P x minus one t, sorry, it's minus one, not plus one. Okay. Which of course, you know, sum over all x or sum over all x minus one is the same thing. So that thing here is just gonna be P tilde of z and t, okay? Okay, so basically this term here is gonna be a e to the power of z, P tilde of z and t. And this term here is gonna give me a k plus e to the power of minus z, not k plus, k minus, sorry. The power of minus z, p tilde of z and t, okay? So, you know, if I wanna rewrite that equation there, I'll get dp tilde z t dt is equal to e to the power of z, k plus, plus e to the power of minus z, k minus, minus k plus, plus k minus, and everything multiplies p to the t. Now it's very easy to solve the equation. p to the of z and t is just gonna be exponential of e to the power of z, k plus, plus e to the power of minus z, k minus, minus k plus, plus k minus, and then I multiply by t, okay? That's the solution of the equation. Now I assume that initially, so you know, p of x zero is equal to delta x zero. Let's just say that initially I start at zero, okay? But it's just the initial condition. And that will, that will tell me that p tilde of c and zero is just equal to one, okay? And that, that you, can, you can show by just using this relationship here, right? So, you know, if at t equals to zero, p of x zero is just delta of, it's just delta of x and zero, p tilde of z and t at t equals to is just gonna be equal to one, okay? Okay, so that's consistent with, this, this initial condition is consistent with what I got, because you know, I can determine this function up to an initial condition, but if I impose this simple initial condition of starting at x equals to zero, meaning initially I have neither Bernard nor, I have done nothing initially, okay. And so that's the solution of the equation. I mean, that's the Laplace transform, but you have a Laplace transform, you have everything. Now, what we wanna do is to calculate the average x and, the average x squared minus x squared, okay? Okay, for that I will define a lambda equals to ln of p tilde of z and t, okay? And that's just gonna be whatever is inside the exponential there. So that's just k plus e to the power of z plus k minus e to the power of minus z then minus k plus, minus k minus p, okay? That's my lambda of z and t, which, you know, is called scalar cumulant generating function, typically. I would have to divide by t, but anyway. Okay, so that's my lambda of z and t. Now, let's... Uh, so lambda, another in, useful formula here will be that lambda of CNT is the ln of sum, sum in x, p, x, t, e to the power of z, x. Yeah, that's it. So if I do t lambda dz, I get 
sum in x, x, p, x, t, e to the power of zx over sum in x, p, x, t, e to the power of zx, okay? <clears throat> and, you know, the lambda dz at z equals to zero is simply going to be the average x, right? I hope that's clear to everybody. I mean, the whole idea is that I had to solve the equation for p of x. In order to do that, I do a Laplace transform. And now what I really want to calculate are the moments of the distribution average x and average x square. In order to do that, I just take the derivatives at z equals to zero of what's called the generating function or more generally the scalar cumulant generating function. Okay, that's the name of z. That's the idea for generating function probability. It's just it's typically easier to calculate than the full probability itself. Though, you know, they contain the same information. They are just expressed in a different way. Okay, so if I do P2 lambda dz2, I don't want to do this explicitly, but I can do that. Uh, that's going to be x square minus x average square, okay? At z equals to zero, okay? Again, okay, it's a fairly easy calculation to do with everything I have done already. So, I mean, it's pretty easy to see from this expression that that's what's going to happen. Okay, so, you know, I have lambda, and you know, if I take a derivative with respect to lambda, it's, it's with respect to z, sorry, it's very simple. These two things here, this is simply going to disappear after I take a derivative. And if the derivative is odd, then I'll get something like k plus minus k minus because of this sign here. And if the derivative is even, I'll get k plus plus k minus, okay? So basically, this is gonna be equals to k plus plus k minus multiplied by t. Remember that I have a t here, okay? So, you know, whatever I do, I'll get a t. And if I do that for x, x is going to be k plus minus k minus multiplied by t also, okay? So again, all I just solved the master equation for a bias random walk by doing a Laplace transform, which is something you should be able to find in several different books, okay? All right, so that's the solution of the equation. So that's the solution of the problem. So we calculated the epsilon square epsilon square is equal to k plus plus, well, let's write it explicitly. So it's x average square minus over. So that's gonna be k plus plus k minus multiplied by t divided by k plus minus k minus square and then I have one t and t square below so I have one over t one over t now what can I see in this expression so equilibrium would mean k plus equals to k minus right would mean the delta mu is zero remember that k plus over k minus must be e to the power of beta delta mu right so uh, in equilibrium this is going to infinity if k plus is equal to k minus minus epsilon diverges. That's something you already know, and it's consistent with this result we got. And the other important thing is the t here, okay? So the longer I run my chemical reaction, the more precise I get, okay? So, you know, naively you might say, okay, so you ask it, the, you know, what's the cost of precision? But, you know, I can get any precision I want because I can just run the chemical reaction forever. And the more I run, the smaller the epsilon I'm gonna get. Okay, so if I wanna get epsilon equals to 1%, I just run the chemical reaction for a long time. And when the time is big enough, I just stop. That is true, but the longer you run, so the longer T, the higher the cost. I don't know if I should write like this. So longer T implies higher cost, okay? So, you know, if I'm burning ATP, constantly burning ATP when I'm running the chemical reaction, 
if I keep running for longer, the cost is also longer. So I do not want to know only about the precision, but I also worried about the cost. And the question I'm asking is if I want to get a certain precision, what's the cost? And running the thing, the chemical reaction for a longer time is not really a very good answer because I'm going to increase my cost. Now let's think about the cost. The cost is going to be very simple to calculate, right? The cost is simply going to be the average X. What's the average X? That's the average number of ATP that, that the chemical reaction has burned. And I just have to multiply this by the delta mu, okay? So every time there is an X, it means that I took a mu S and I transformed it into a mu P, okay? So the energy that I, that I use for every single substrate I take is just delta mu, right? Equals to mu S minus mu P. So if I want to calculate the, the average cost of the chemical reaction, that's just the average X multiplied by delta. It's a pretty simple formula, okay? Which is, you know, again, the, that's the average rate of entropy production multiplied by T, okay? So my cost is simply going to be equals to K plus minus K minus delta mu T. Now what you see is what I was discussing. While the uncertainty gets better the longer I run, the cost gets worse the longer I run, okay? So while the uncertainty goes with one over T, and that's very general, okay? That would be true for any thermodynamic flux in any circumstance. The cost grows with T, which also is gonna be true for pretty much any sort of steady state you can imagine, okay? So running the thing for a longer time does not really solve this problem. And the interesting thing happens when I multiply both things. So let's multiply both things. Let's do cost multiplied by epsilon square. What do I get when I multiply these two things? Well, so the cost is gonna be K plus minus K minus, that is a delta mu. The cost has a T. And then the uncertainty was K plus plus K minus over K plus minus K minus square. And I have a one over T. Now the T will disappear when I look at this product. Okay, there is no time anymore. This square cancels out with this. And so that's gonna be equal to delta mu, K plus plus K minus over K plus minus K minus. That's the product, cost multiplied by epsilon square. Now I can use the fact that K plus over K minus must be equal to e to the power of beta delta mu, okay? So this cost is going to be delta mu e to the power of beta delta mu plus one over e to the power of beta delta mu minus one, okay? Now, this is actually an increasing function of delta mu, okay? So if you plot this function here, it's gonna be an increasing function of delta mu. I mean, it's easy to see, right? For large the length of delta mu, it just grows linearly with delta mu, okay? But it is an increasing function of delta mu. And uh, so the minimum is gonna be reached when delta mu goes to zero, okay? For delta mu going to zero, but not strictly zero, limit of delta mu going to zero. Strictly zero, I get no uncertainty, but in the limit of delta mu going to zero is when I'm gonna reach the minimum of this function. And if I do this calculation for delta mu going to zero, this expression here becomes delta mu multiplied by two over beta delta mu, right? Again, all I did here is a Taylor expansion, okay? So if I, if I write exponential as one plus beta delta mu, for both exponentials, I can do that, right? I'm gonna get delta mu multiplied by two, then the next order term beta delta mu is not gonna matter in the term up, in the term down, you know, the one cancels out, okay? So this cancels out, that is actually 2KBT, right? So basically what I'm saying is that the cost multiplied by epsilon square must be larger than the limit of delta mu going to zero of that expression, because again, this is an increasing function of delta mu, which is 2KBT, okay? And this relation here, is what's called the thermodynamic uncertainty relation. It tells me, what does it tell me? Let's say I want a precision of 1%. So let's say epsilon 
I want epsilon equal to 10 to the power of minus two. It means that the minimal cost of 1% is 20,000 kBT, okay? So there is no way you can have a chemical reaction or whatever you can have. A, I mean, in general, X can be seen as a thermodynamic flux, okay? There is no way you can have a thermodynamic flux with better than 1% precision if you're not willing to pay 20,000 kBT, which is, you know, a good amount of energy. 1% is not that precise if you think about things that happen in biology, for example, okay? So that's the thermodynamic uncertainty relation. That's what the product tells you. The product says you, if you want to get an uncertainty epsilon, you must dissipate at least two divided by epsilon square KBT. And you know, the reason you should look at the product, I mean, the motivation that we had was simply that the T would disappear, okay? So the T disappears, then you should get something. And it turns out that this something will give you a limit. Of course, this is true for everything. So, you know, um, I did an example here for this enzyme, okay? I did the calculation explicitly and show that the inequality is true, but this inequality is true for everything. By everything, I mean, you take a stochastic process, okay? You pick a current, so, you know, X would be some current. So, again, that's the thermodynamic asymmetry relation. Again, proving it in general is a little bit sophisticated. It's not something I can do in these lectures, okay? There are different ways of proving it in general. One of them is by using what's called level 2.5 large deviations. The other one, you have to use some inequalities from information theory. Um, and I, as far as I know, there are these two methods pretty much that you can use to prove this relation. Again, the proof is a little bit involved, a little bit more involved than the proof from the fluctuation theorem. But at least for this example, it's simple to demonstrate. And again, in general, okay, in general, let's say I have a general Markov process in stochastic thermodynamics, then I can define some current X. It could be any current you want, okay? It can be a single current. And typically there'll be many different currents in your problem, in your model. So, you know, let's say I look at a single X and then I can define uh, the diffusion coefficient associated with that current as X square minus X. And typically people divide this by two, okay? That's kind of a definition of a diffusion coefficient. And then I define the current as the average X per T. And you know, the cost is gonna be my enter production sigma multiplied by T, okay? And now the uncertainty relation, I mean, that I derived there will simply be expressed as two D divided by J square multiplied by sigma must be larger than two, okay? That's pretty much the same thing that I did before. That's a general way of writing. And again, my sigma here is gonna be that formula that we had before, right? Sum over I, PI, WIJ, ln of WIJ over WJ. Okay, that's just the entry production. Again, that's a very non-trivial relation because J, again, sigma might involve many the sum of many different currents and J can be any single current you want in your model, okay? Again, for this simple example, it's very simple. It's just, there's just one current. So it's a much simpler, but you know, if you had something more complicated, then these things are way less trivial. And again, the proof is a little bit involved, okay? I mean, when we conjectured it, it was in 2015, we did not really have a proof. It was a conjecture. I think one year after it was the first proof, more or less. Okay, so again, that's the thermodynamic uncertainty relation. It tells you about what's the minimal cost of precision. Again, it's not like the quantum mechanics uncertainty relation. You know, it's not about the precision of two different things. It's just about precision, the relationship between precision and thermodynamic cost, okay? Okay, so given that we now know what's the thermodynamic uncertainty relation, let's talk about some applications of this relation, so. Thermodynamic uncertainty relation, okay. All right, so let's say we have a molecular motor, okay. So the first application would be for a molecular motor. And let's say I have an experiment with a molecular motor and I can measure X, is the position of the motor, okay? 
Now the motor is like a machine that, you know, I guess Edgar told you about that, but the motor is a machine that burns chemical work, burns ATP, use chemical work to do some mechanical work, maybe to, to push some colloidal particle. But, you know, if we were to write like the second law for that load, the entry production for this thing would look like I have some chemical work minus uh, the force multiplied by the current, where this current here is just the position of the motor divided by, by the time, right? It's just the velocity of the motor, okay? So J here would be just be the velocity of the motor, okay? Now, again, I can measure X. I can measure the position of the motor, but I cannot measure uh, the amount of ATP the motor, the motor is burning, okay? I don't really know what's the chemical reaction scheme for the burning of the ATP, which is, you know, can be the case in many different experiments, okay? So different motors have different chemical reaction schemes. They, these pathways can be a little bit more complicated, a little bit simpler. But I mean, I'm not really able to monitor how much ATP the motor is burning, but I can monitor the position of the motor. That's something easy to monitor in the experiment, okay? Okay, here I'm assuming that KB equals to T equals to one, okay? So there is no temperature that I'm gonna write here. It's just for simplicity, okay? So I can only measure X and I would like to know about the efficiency of the motor, which is just, you know, this thing here would be the mechanical work, right? Let's call it W mechanical. So, you know, it's just the velocity of the motor, not the mechanical, this is the mechanical power, okay? And this is the power, it's work per unit of time and that's mechanical work per unit of time, okay? So they're both power. And, you know, if I wanted to calculate that, that would be like my F, F being the external force, okay? So again, in this notation, F is the external force and J is the velocity of the motor, okay? So that would be just FJ divided by the chemical work, right? Again, that's not something I can calculate because I cannot calculate the chemical work, okay? I don't know what's the ATP. But I would like to infer the efficiency, at least a bound on the efficiency, by simply measuring X. And how can I do that? Well, I can do that by using the thermodynamic uncertainty relation, okay? So let's say I can measure X, okay? Or, or I can measure J equals to X over T. And I can also measure the diffusion coefficient of the motor, where it's gonna be X square minus X average square over two T, okay? And again, the two here is just some convention people who typically define diffusion coefficient dividing by two, okay? Okay, so I can measure these two things. And what we know from the thermodynamic set relation is that two D sigma over J square must be larger than two, okay? Okay, now all I have to do is, so D and J is something I can measure. Sigma, I cannot measure but I can find a bound on sigma. If I can find a bound on sigma, that's the same as finding a bound on efficiency. So what you do here is you use these two equations, W chemical minus Fj. Again, F is the force, okay? F is like the force that I have to do to drag a colloidal particle or something like that. And J is the velocity of the motor, okay? Uh, and I use the equation at equals to Fj over W chem. So my J can be written as, my Sigma can be written as FJ uh, one over eta, eta meaning the efficiency minus one, right? That's my Sigma. Okay, now I'm gonna throw this equation here. They both choose can cancel, okay. So I get T. Again, this stuff I can measure is just a diffusion coefficient of the position of the motor. And I get Fj over J square, then one over eta minus one is larger or equal than one, okay? So D over J, F is larger or equal than eta over 
one minus zeta, right? So one minus zeta, well, okay. So if you keep doing that, I don't want to do all steps. That's a bit pedantic. So you are going to find that eta is less or equal than one or F D over J plus F D. Again, J is just the average velocity of the motor and D is just a diffusion coefficient of the motor. So, I mean, even if you don't measure anything about the ATP, you know nothing about the ATP, you can still infer the efficiency of the motor, at least a bound on the efficiency of the motor by measuring the, the position of the motor or the average position of the motor and the fluctuations of the motor, okay? So the fluctuations can tell you something about the efficiency, okay? Which is not really trivial. So, you know, the thermodynamic relation can be think as the minimal cost of precision, but can also be seen as an inference too, okay? You can always infer enter production, and in this case, efficiency, um, by simply measure the position of the motor and fluctuations of this position of the motor, okay? So that would be one application of the thermodynamic uncertainty relation. All right, I will think about a second one, a similar one, but here it's not really about measuring thing. Uh, so let's now think about a steady state. heat engine. Again, so the first application I talked about was simply, I can infer the efficiency of the motor by simply look at the position. I have to know nothing about how much about the chemical work, about how exactly the motor is burning ATP or about how much ATP it's burning. Without any knowledge about that, I'm able to bound the efficiency of the motor, okay? That's the first thing. I just have to measure the position of the motor. And again, you know, there are very old experiments. Uh, by very old, I mean mid 90s. Uh, where people were, that's when single model experiments model has started, right? And uh, there are experiments from the 90s where people do measure this J and this D, but you know, they, at least at that time, they didn't know anything about the efficiency of the model. Okay, okay so let's think now about a steady state heat engine. Now, what's a heat engine? So the engine will take heat from a hot reservoir <laughs> and the heat will do some work and release, I don't know if release is a good word, but Let's leave it release heat into a cold reservoir. That's a heat engine and imagine a steady state heat engine, okay? It's operating at steady state. So, you know, probably I should have done a picture. That's a better idea. So I have a hot reservoir. I have my system, which is my engine. So hot reservoir, temperature hot. That is heat going to the system, then some of the heat go to the cold reservoir. Okay. And this could be a work reservoir. I don't know if I should call it, I can call it work reservoir if you want. And then, you know, the, it will deliver some work. Okay. Okay. So for this problem, if we write the second law, the enter production sigma is going to be the rate of heat dissipated in the hot reservoir plus the rate of heat dissipated in the cold reservoir. And that must be multiplied by BTH. Now, QH here is dissipated. Q is always dissipated heat, okay? So heat minus QH will be heat taken from hot reservoir, okay? So the idea here is that minus QH is positive, QC is positive, and let's call this W as work per unit of time. So all these things are gonna be positive, okay? So that's the second law, 
So that's much larger equal to zero. And my first law is that the work or the power, because here is all period of time, so it's entry production, the power is going to be minus QH minus QC, okay? Remember that minus QH is heat taken from the whole reservoir, and minus QC would be heat taken from the cold reservoir, which is negative. So, you know, QC is positive, QH is negative, okay? So, this is the second law, and this is the first law, okay? Now, I'm not using the uncertainty relation yet, but what is known here, and maybe I can derive that. Let's see. Yeah, I have time for that. So, Okay. Typical, yes. Maybe you can do return break for us if somebody has a question. Okay. Ravi, do you have a question? Yeah. Ah, you have a question. Yeah. <laughs> like, I mean, can, people. <laughs> can, you, can you hear me? Yeah. Like in, in the previous exercise, but we bound the, yeah, the efficiency. Yeah. How good is, is that bound? Like if you see the, the real efficiency of, of a motor? It depends. Can be okay, can be quite bad. It can be even larger than one. So of course, when it's larger than one, then it doesn't tell you anything. So I remember Patrick did that. Patrick was a student with Fudo. Now he's a postdoc at the MPI in Dresden. So it's Patrick Pizonka, the full name. So I remember he did that. <sighs> for some experimental data and some points you would get like 0 0.5 and some points you would get something larger than one. I mean, typically, if you were to bound the sigma, the bound would be quite bad because you are far from equilibrium and typically when you're very far from equilibrium, the bound is quite far. But for the efficiency, when you do all these ratios, I mean, you know, it's, I don't really know how good it is also because in these experiments, they don't know what's the efficiency of the motor because they don't know how much ATP you burn. But, you know, if you know nothing about the efficiency of the motor, just the fact that you know, for example, that the bound is, you know, the efficiency must be below 0 0.5 is already something in a sense. But in general, it, there are better methods probably to infer the efficiency of the motor. That would be a more direct one. But uh, it, can be, it can be okay. It can be bad. It depends. Okay, thank you. Somebody Are there ways to improve the bound, including the difference in the chemical potential? Is there like a general way of doing this? Yes, yes, we have. Uh, so you know, I I talked about the, the uncertainty relation here. We do have a version of the uncertainty relation where we find an inequality that takes into account the affinity, the thermodynamic force. So that is a there is a bound that we have found. I mean, we found this already. If you read the original paper of the uncertainty relation, the bound is there a little bit. Then we wrote papers about that. We wrote papers about how to infer things considering the thermodynamic uh, force, which is the delta mu in this case, into account. But there is a bound, the inequality, that does take delta mu into account. And that would be more, it would give you a definitely a much tighter bound I don't know if we can do a bound on efficiency. That would be a little bit more complicated, but um, there are bounds that do take the delta mu into account and they are, they are better. Yeah. And I mean, we, we did that as a conjecture pretty much when we wrote the first paper. And then after, I don't know, it took us maybe one or two years after we have a proof of this kind of bound that does take the delta mu into account. So, wait, wait, wait. there was someone in the chat. Ah, yeah. Yes, and sometimes there is some question in the chat. I think you want that I read for you? Sure, okay. I can't read the chat right now. Okay, you can't or you can? I cannot. Okay, I will read for you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the first question is uh, nothing. The second question, K plus, uh, the limit K plus go to K minus and T go to infinity is a, is a commute, is two limits. Is what? Uh, okay. Uh, they uh, commute. Yeah. I mean, K 
K plus, going to K minus. It depends on what you're calculating, I guess. Uh, <laughs> I mean, in this in this case, I don't really have to care too much. I mean, for the bias random walk, really, even for finite t, it works. I don't have to take t going to infinity. So for this t, for this for this calculation I did, I don't really take the limit t going to infinity. Uh, but if you were to do a calculation, first you would take t going to infinity, then you would think about k plus the limit of what's called linear response theory, okay? The limit where the delta, the delta mu is small, okay? That's the limit that you would do after t going to infinity. Whether both limits commute, I'm not sure. It depends on the situation. But I, I don't think I don't think it's very really relevant for this thing. Typically, you just take t going to infinity. After that, you deal with you deal with like linear response theory making k plus close to k minus. Okay, so I assist for right. people which are on online as Su Su Jung, which has this question. You can interrupt Andre when you want because no, we don't see your question after maybe it's, it's, it was one hour ago. So it's better for the next time that you interrupt the speaker by telling I have yeah. a question. This is good. We are here for uh, for a question. So, do you do you, do you listen to me, Sun Sun Jung? Yes, Sun yes, I, I yeah, I will do that. Thank you. Okay, Thank you perfect, much. perfect. Okay. Alexander, Ale Alexander. Okay, no, ah. okay. no question. Okay, so Andre, you have uh, again twenty minutes. Okay. Does nobody have other question. Okay, so Andre, you have again twenty minutes today. Okay. I will okay. try to close the chat. Okay. Okay, so let's go back to the case of an engine, okay? So the engine is taking heat from a hot reservoir, deliver it to the cold reservoir and doing some work. Now, you know, if I use these two equations here, I mean, I'm gonna do something that you probably did in your thermal physics course. So, you know, uh, let's make QH disappear. So QH, no, let's make QC disappear, not QH. QC is equal to minus QH minus W, right? So I get sigma is equal to beta H QH plus beta C minus QH minus W. And that must be larger than zero, right? Of course, remember that the efficiency of the heat engine is gonna be W over minus QH, okay? That's just the efficiency of the engine. It's the work divide, and it is not work, okay? W here is power, not work. It's work period of time because sigma is enter production, is rate of enter production. So this is all heat period of time and work period of time, okay? So it's power. Okay, so W is my power. I have my efficiency. Um, I have my sigma, so sigma is gonna be, beta C minus beta H minus QH. Again, remember that the minus QH is the positive one, uh, minus beta C W. W is the extracted work or extracted power, sorry. That's larger than zero, okay? So that pretty much means that my efficiency, you know, if I divide everything by beta C, I will get that the efficiency eta equals to W over minus QH. That's just a reminder, okay? It's gonna be smaller than the Carnot efficiency, okay? Which is one minus. You can add it with betas or with T. So let's do with betas. It's beta H over beta C, okay? That is TC over TH if you like, okay? And that's the C here means Carnot, okay? Carnot. So that's the Carnot efficiency. And you know what is known here is that the efficiency is smaller than the Carnot efficiency. That's very well known. That's just the second law. But now I would like to use the certainty relation to find something better than this, okay? I would, I would like a relation that involves W power, that involves the diffusion coefficient of the power, and that involves the efficiency, okay? Why, okay, the efficiency is about the Carnot efficiency, the result that's known for hundreds of years, uh, this result does not really tell us much about power, okay? What happens at finite time, okay? Now, I can do that by looking at sigma. So sigma can be written as 
beta C minus beta H. Then I have this minus QH minus beta CW, right? So that's what I wrote for sigma. Now, this QH here can be written as W divided by the efficiency eta, right? Remember that the efficiency was defined as W over minus QH, okay? Okay, that is the first relation I need, okay? I I'm writing sigma in terms of efficiency and W. The other relation I would need was the uncertainty relation, which would be two DW uh, sigma over W square must be larger than two. And you know, I will do KB equals to one and TC equals to one also for the reminder of this relation. Okay, so if you do that and you manipulate this equation, so from these two equations, if we just throw this sigma here, you are gonna find this relation here, W over DW divided by eta, Carnot efficiency minus efficiency to the power of minus one must be smaller or equal to one, okay? That's a very nice relation, okay? So the first relation we had, again, that's just the second law. The second law does not tell us anything about power, okay? Now, if you remember thermodynamics, you must do quasi-static things, okay? If the system is quasi-static, it means that the time it takes to complete a cycle is infinite, okay? If this time is infinite, it means my power is zero, okay? So for an ideal engine that does reach the Carnot efficiency, my power has to be zero. That's in complete agreement with this equation here. So if I have eta C, uh, going to eta going to eta c, this number here becomes infinity, but I must be smaller than one. For that to be the case, my w has to be zero, okay? So if I want to approach the Carnot efficiency, I need a power that goes to zero, okay? But that equation is very nice because if I want to get a certain efficiency, that there is a trade-off between power and efficiency, okay? That's a very explicit trade-off between power and efficiency. And that, I mean, there was nothing like that, I guess, before this relation was out. And again, it's a direct application of the thermodynamic uncertainty relation. Now, the, another interesting point about this relation is that there is another way of making the Carnot efficiency or an efficiency approach the Carnot efficiency. And this way is to make DW very small, no, very large. So if I have a very large DW, then I can make my efficiency approach the Carnot efficiency. So if I, if I have a finite power, but my power has huge fluctuations, then my efficiency can come very close to the Carnot efficiency, okay? That's it would be, and there is, there are examples in the literature of people finding something approaching the Carnot efficiency, uh, but at the cost of having a very large, uh, not the cost, but you know, you just need really large fluctuations. So, you know, that would what, what might happen close to a critical point where you can have large fluctuations and, yeah, so you know that's a very another application. Again, the idea here is not really that I want to infer the, the the efficiency. That's not the idea. I just want a trade-off between efficiency, power, and fluctuations of the power, okay, or of the work, okay. And that's the relation. Yeah. Could you repeat what was DW? Sorry, I got the DW is just a diffusion coefficient of the work. So you know, if x, you know, if my W is x over t. X being the work, okay, so X would be whatever is the work in this engine you are dealing with, then the D is just gonna be X square, the DW. I didn't call it a D now, I should call it D as before, but yeah, it's just the same as before. Whatever my X is, the X would depend on what the model is, but X is just the variable that's counting the work, okay? X would be the total work that I do, okay? If I divide it by time, I get my power. And, you know, the DW would just be the diffusion coefficient. So, you know, if you think about the molecular motor, my X is not really the position of the motor, but would be the position multiplied by the force F, okay? That's what would give me my work, okay? So something like that. So, you know, again, that's, you know, that's, that goes a little bit beyond, right? The second law, which just tells you that the efficiency the maximum efficiency, the efficiency here, it tells you something a little bit stronger that there is a trade-off between power and efficiency. 
And you know, you, you can get a certain power with a certain efficiency, but the, this trade-off also involves fluctuations of the work. Okay, so I guess I finished the lecture here. If there are more questions, I'm happy to answer them. Is there a I have one question. You say that you can approach the Galois limit by having a DHT, no? Yeah. Okay, so you can approach Carnot efficiency like uh, having extreme fluctuations in the model. Something like that. Something like that, yeah. I mean, there, there is a paper about that, but it's not really a model. It's like an Ising model. And uh, what they do is that if, if you make, if you are like close to criticality, where, you know, fluctuations get, go like a power law, they show that you can approach current efficiency. But, you know, I should say that there is no limit to how close you can come to the current efficiency, okay? I mean, strictly speaking, efficiency equal to the current efficiency typically is only this quasi-static limit, but, coming close to the kind of efficiency is always possible, okay? So, you know, if you have an efficiency that is extremely close to the kind of efficiency by 99% close, that's, that can always happen, okay? And that happens a lot in many different models. So there is no, I mean, the second law simply tells you that the efficiency is smaller than the kind of efficiency, okay? But it doesn't tell you how close you can come, okay? It simply tells that there is a strict case where I really become equals, only it's, it's this quasi-static limit. But this equation is a little bit more explicit, selling that typically if you are close to this kind of efficiency, you're probably either getting a low power or large fluctuations, one of the two. Thank you. All right. And maybe this question is a bit stupid, but what came to mind, is there a way to connect this with the fluctuation dissipation theorem? This is what, the... the the thermodynamic state relation or, or the thermodynamic state relation, you mean? The standard factorization dissipation theorem connecting it to uh, kind of transport coefficients, the fluctuations in the system. I mean, so the fluctuation dissipation theorem is a relation between fluctuations and, and the response function, right? I mean, the fluctuation dissipation yeah. theorem is about a response function. So, I mean, there is a connection with the fluctuation theorem. Okay, you can derive the fluctuation dissipation theorem or a version of the fluctuation dissipation theorem from the fluctuation theorem. That's possible. Okay. Now, with the uncertainty relation, I mean, if you do, that is not really a, that. I mean, first, the, the philosophy is very different because again, in, in the in the fluctuation dissipation theorem, I'm comparing, I'm comparing uh, fluctuations with a response function in the in the in the thermodynamic state relation, I'm, comp I'm comparing fluctuations with cost. Okay, there is no response function in the fluctuation in the thermodynamic state relation. There is no response function there, so it's sort of physically different. Now, if you do, if you do a linear response, if you do the thermodynamic state relation in linear response theory, okay, then you kind of will find that that bound B equal to two is the same as the fluctuation dissipation relation, but that's more like a coincidence. So it only happens if you are doing linear response theory and if you are doing like a unicycle, for example, okay? But that's really, it's more, I would say it's more a coincidence because they, they you know, the Onzaga coefficient must be equal to the diffusion coefficient. But again, um, in general, it, they, are, they are different relations. I mean, the idea of the thermodynamic relation has nothing to do with, there is no response function there, okay? But the, the, the fluctuation dissipation theorem is connected to the fluctuation theorem, though. That one, you can derive the FTT from the FT. That's possible, in principle. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah. Uh, hi, my name is Dana, and I was wondering, you said that you could increase the diffusion constant, and then you would have fluctuations at transition point. So in general, will all kind of processes become reversible at transition? Because usually with the Canoe with Cano cycles, you have reversible. Uh... I mean, yeah, so uh, what I said is a little bit more complicated, but um, in the Cano cycle, it's not, this would not be a reversible cycle. This would be a cycle that operates, I mean, this kind of model they did was a model that operates at finite time. 
that is enter production, that the production is not zero. So it's not, it's not, uh, it's not reversible in this sense. It's not zero enter production. It's not quasi static like the typical Carnot cycle, okay? And they have, and, and they use the fact that they operate close to criticality in a sense to kind of try to achieve an efficiency that's very close to the current efficiency. But I, I mean, it's a bit, I want to be careful to compare this relation. It's not so simple, but but yeah, in the Carnot cycle, this, this kind of paper I'm talking about, it was a paper that people did. I, I should probably give reference in the last lecture tomorrow. So I'll try to give some references. Um, but there it's not like the Carnot cycle, okay? It's not, it's not quasi static, which is a very important point. And it's not, it's not reversible in the sense what I'm saying. The reversible simply means that the production is zero. It's not zero than the production. It is non-zero. Okay, so it, it moves towards the Carnot efficiency, but it doesn't resemble the Carnot cycle. It moves to the Carnot efficiency and different from the Carnot cycle, it's not finite, it's not infinite time. Okay, it's not quasi static, yes. it's finite time, okay. and it's not it's not reversible. All right. Thank but you. again, this is not, I mean. You can always come very close to the Carnot efficiency, okay? That's not, I mean, this was known even before. It's not, I mean, you shouldn't be so surprised if you see, I don't know, 99% of the Carnot efficiency. What is probably true is that being equal to the Carnot efficiency, you know, equality should probably be only reached that the, I mean, there might be a case where the, these fluctuations really diverge and you take a thermodynamic limit and you might reach an equality. That could be the case. But you know, equality typically is reached in this in this Carnot cycle, this quasi-static uh, reversible limit. Thank you. I have another question. Yeah, get closer because. Sorry, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, you reach the um, like um, you should reach the inequality at the equilibrium, no? The thermodynamic concentrity relation. Not at equilibrium and in linear. At equilibrium, strictly speaking, the, the epsilon is infinite and the sigma is zero. So, but close in the linear response regime, close to equilibrium, I would say, not at equilibrium. Mm, at equilibrium, so, things are not really defined, I would say. Okay, but it means also that every time that you are like close to saturate the, the inequality, you are so close to equilibrium also. Typically, when I saturate the inequality, I mean, if I'm close to equilibrium, I might not saturate the inequality. It's possible to be very far from the inequality, even if you are close to equilibrium. But if you are close to the inequality, you must be close to equilibrium. Okay. But in a diffusion process, you can saturate out of equilibrium. Right? Andre is talking about the Markov Tian process. So you can have a diffusion. In diffusion, you can you can saturate in a diffusion. Uh, but that that I mean that's because diffusion is kind of a linear response thing. But yeah, sure. Yeah. I mean, you, you can you can kind of when you when you do this diffusion limit to a diffusion process, it's like you are in a linear response regime, more or less. But yeah, that's what Edgar is saying is true. But diffusion is kind of a linear response thing. But okay, yeah. Okay, thank you. There's a question online. Do you see? No. Please read for me. Okay, so I, I tell you uh, when. The waiting time distribution is power law. Could we model the system using Markovian process? I mean, yes and no. So if, I mean, nothing is really a power law because there is always a cutoff, okay? So, you know, if, if it's a finite system, your power law must have a cutoff at some point. Uh, so if there is a cutoff, then you can. If there is no cutoff, but, you know, in reality, there must be some cutoff. At some point, your power law must stop, okay? So if there is no cutoff, probably not. If there is a cutoff, then yes. That would be my question. My answer, sorry. Question. But I, I, you know, for example, power laws that show up in like biophysics, they will have some cutoff, okay? They come, I mean, in, you know, this Markov and no Markov and thing might be a problem if you're doing like quantum stuff. So if you do a quantum open system, then things will be truly no Markov and there is no way out of it. But if you think about things in biophysics, biomolecular stuff, that uh, you know there is no quantum effects there, the, at least at some level of description, the Markov description must be a good one. At some point, it must be. I don't know any examples where you know it's never going to be. But for quantum open systems where there is like a quantum open no Markovian process, then the no Markovian character is impossible to 
sort it out. It is really no Markov and then it's kind of a problem, but yeah. Okay, there's a remark and uh, line, but other questions? Well, if there are no more questions, we thank Andre again. And we continue this afternoon with. Uh, next week, talk on race tomorrow. Next tomorrow, yeah. Okay. And just a noon, there is a lecture of Juan. Exactly. This afternoon is Juan. Uh, we take afternoon is for work. Exercise. Uh, uh, Quarter past three. Three fifteen. Okay, so, so we. Now we go to. to you, you go all we close the system the here. We go all to the rest of the range. I'm like this. Now we go back.